Today, we're uh, zooming in on a chemical that poses this sort of silent but really profound danger, methanol. Mm -hmm. This is a toxic alcohol, and it's surprisingly common, you know, lurking in items ranging from windshield wiper fluid industrial solvents right even perfumes which always surprises people exactly and things like fuel for chafing dishes the kind you see at buffets methanol uh chemically it's ch3oh it's classified as a toxic alcohol simple formula looks simple yeah mm -hmm. but if exposure happens its potential for causing well catastrophic morbidity and mortality mm. is just extreme. So our goal today is really to give you a kind of clinical shortcut to unpack why methanol is so dangerous, where you actually find it, right. and critically, how the body's own chemistry turns it into a poison. It creates this ticking clock scenario that demands, you know, immediate action. And to start, it's really important to realize that exposure isn't just about drinking it. I mean, mm. injection is the most common route. Absolutely. Mm. But toxicity can also happen through skin absorption or even inhalation, especially maybe in like occupational settings. So where are we most likely to bump into this stuff day to day? Because like you said, when I think poison, I don't usually picture the auto parts store. But that's kind of where the surprise is, isn't mm. it? Our sources flag common industrial solvents, certain types of antifreeze. Okay. But then there are the less obvious places, carburetor cleaner, fluid for copy machines, even, as we mentioned, perfumes. Wow. And for those really serious cases, accidental or intentional ingestion, Windshield wiper fluid comes up again and again as a major source. And when we look at the uh, the epidemiology, who are the specific groups that clinicians are most worried about? When there's a suspected exposure, who's top of mind? Well, the primary high-risk groups tend to be toddlers and young children. Mm. You know, that exploratory behavior, getting into things under the sink. Right, of course. And we also, unfortunately, see high rates among individuals with alcohol use disorder. Sometimes they seek out methanol containing things like fuel or solvents as a really dangerous substitute for ethanol. And there's also suicidal behavior as a factor, too, right? Yes. Tragically, that's another significant risk group identified in the data. And this isn't just some historical footnote. These risks are current. They're significant. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The data really confirms how serious this is. In 2023, U.S. poison centers tracked roughly 3,000 cases needing treatment with the antidote Fumasoli. 3,000? Yeah. And methanol poisoning was confirmed as contributing to 24 deaths just in that year. It's a persistent, serious challenge for emergency medicine. Okay, let's maybe shift to the central puzzle here. Methanol itself. It's relatively non-intoxicating compared to drinking ethanol, isn't it? That's right, initially. But it's exponentially more lethal. So what happens inside the body? What transforms this like relatively mild compound into a systemic poison? This is the absolute key insight for methanol toxicity. Mm. The parent compound, the methanol itself. It's not the killer. Okay. The severe toxicity is caused entirely by the metabolites. These chemical products created when your liver tries to break the methanol down. Ah, so the poison is the product of metabolism. Exactly. The poison in this case truly is the product. It's a metabolic trap. Let's follow that chemical journey then. You said it's a two-step process driven by two key enzymes, mostly happening in the liver. That's right. Mainly in the liver. So what's the first enzyme? What kicks off this uh, chain reaction? So the first step relies on alcohol dehydrogenase, or ADH. You probably heard of it in relation to regular alcohol. Right, ADH. This enzyme rapidly oxidizes the methanol, the CH3OH, into a substance called formaldehyde. Formaldehyde, okay, that already sounds bad. Like preservation fluid, bad? It is bad, yeah. yeah. But it's actually just the intermediate step. It's pretty fleeting. Fleeting. Yeah, it doesn't hang around long before it's immediately oxidized again by another enzyme, aldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay, step two. And this second reaction generates the final and most devastating substance, formic acid, or... Technically, it's unprotonated form, formate. Formic acid, and that's the stuff that unleashes chaos across the body. That leads to the massive illness. Precisely. Formic acid is the agent responsible for the hallmark clinical sign of severe methanol toxicity. That elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis we hear about. Right. It doesn't just make the blood slightly acidic. It severely disrupts cellular respiration. It particularly targets the machinery inside the mitochondria basically paralyzing energy production at a cellular level. Wow. And what's equally frightening, I think, is the challenge of clearing this poison. If formic acid is so destructive, why doesn't the body just, you know, get rid of it quickly? Well, it accumulates because the body's normal ways of clearing things out just really struggle with formic acid. It has a high volume of distribution. It kind of spreads out and stays active. Okay. And think about this. If a patient isn't treated, 
The unmetabolized methanol itself has this incredibly long estimated half-life. It can stretch anywhere from 30 to 85 hours. 85 hours. Yeah. Which means the potential for massive formate production, the toxic stuff, is hanging around for days. That long half-life really gives context for the toxic dose then. What amount of methanol actually pushes a potential exposure into like a potentially lethal event? Generally, a dose of about one gram per kilogram of body weight is considered potentially lethal. To put that in perspective, it's roughly one to two milliliters of pure methanol per kilogram. So not a huge amount. No, not at all. And clinically, treatment is always mandated when blood concentrations get over 25 milligrams per deciliter. It's a key threshold. Okay, this brings us to what sounds like the most clinically challenging part, this latent period. Tell us about this ticking clock that physicians are up against. The latent period is absolutely critical and terrifying. For the first 12, maybe 24 hours after someone ingests methanol, they might seem deceptively normal. Deceptively normal? Yeah, maybe just mildly inebriated, like they had a drink or two. But this is because the toxic metabolites, the formic acid, haven't fully built up yet. So they feel okay, maybe a bit off, but the damage is brewing. Exactly. This delay makes diagnosis incredibly difficult. The patient might not seek help or might get sent home, but the damage is essentially guaranteed unless intervention happens during that window. Once that formic acid does accumulate, where does it hit hardest? Where does it cause that permanent debilitating damage? Formic acid has this terrifying specificity, really, for two main areas. First, the retina. The eye. The eyes. Yes. It's highly sensitive to formic acid. This leads to the rapid onset of ocular symptoms, things like blurry vision, decreased visual acuity, sensitivity to light. Okay. And a really specific symptom called halo vision, seeing halos around lights. Permanent blindness is a major, major risk. That's devastating. And what's the second major target? The central nervous system, specifically a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. They are highly susceptible to damage from formic acid. Basal ganglia. Yeah. Clinicians often find what's called bilateral basal ganglia necrosis, basically tissue death in those areas on both sides of the brain, sometimes with bleeding, hemorrhage associated with... I have consequences. Patients who survive severe poisoning often walk away with permanent neurological deficits. Commonly, these manifest as Parkinsonian features movement problems similar to Parkinson's disease. Wow. And of course, untreated patients, they rapidly progress to coma, circulatory failure, respiratory failure, and ultimately, death. The diagnosis itself, then, seems really challenging because those initial symptoms are so misleading, so nonspecific. How do doctors confirm methanol poisoning quickly, especially when the clinical picture changes so dramatically over time? Yeah, it's tricky. They rely on tracking two different lab measurements that essentially act as time markers for where the patient is in the process. Okay, two markers. Early on, right after ingestion, before much metabolism has happened, the parent methanol compound itself causes an elevated osmolar gap, or O-gap. O-gap. Because the methanol molecule itself is floating around in the blood. Exactly. It's osmotically active. It pulls water. So it increases that gap. Seeing a high O-gap early on points towards the presence of the methanol itself. But, but then as the methanol gets converted to formic acid, right. what happens? Right. As the liver enzymes do their work, the osmolar gap will start to narrow because the parent compound, the methanol, is being used up. Okay, O-cap goes down. But at the same time, the anion gap metabolic acidosis, the A-gap widens dramatically. Because of the formic acid building up? Precisely. That accumulation of toxic formic acid causes the acidosis, which drives the A-gap way up. So if a patient presents already showing severe acidosis, a high A-gap. That means the conversion has mostly happened. They're in the danger zone. Exactly. It means the bulk of the metabolic conversion has already occurred, and they are in the highest risk phase for organ damage. This is why understanding the timing of ingestion is so crucial for the diagnostic team. That makes sense. So once a methanol poisoning is confirmed, or even just highly suspected, What's the immediate life-saving strategy? What's aimed at stopping this deadly chemical conversion right in its tracks? The entire treatment strategy really hinges on blocking that first enzyme we talked about, alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH. Stopping it before it makes formaldehyde. Exactly. We need to slam the brakes on formic acid production. And the gold standard antidote for this is fompizol. Fompizol. Yeah, it's a powerful ADH inhibitor. It's generally easier to dose than the older alternative, and critically, it doesn't cause central nervous system depression or inebriation itself. But there's a downside. The main one is cost. It is quite expensive. Okay, 
So what if Fumpazole isn't immediately available, maybe in a smaller hospital or a resource-limited setting? Is there an older option? Yes, there is. Ethanol. Good old drinking alcohol. Ethanol. How does that work? It works because ethanol also competes for that same enzyme, ADH. But crucially, ethanol has a significantly higher affinity for the enzyme than methanol does. Ah, so it kind of elbows the methanol out of the way? Pretty much. By giving the patient ethanol intravenously and maintaining high serum concentrations, the target is around 100 milligrams per deciliter. You effectively occupy almost all the ADH enzyme sites. So the methanol can't get processed. Right. It allows the relatively inert methanol to be slowly eliminated through other routes, like breathing it out or through the kidneys, before it can be converted to formic acid. What are the drawbacks to using ethanol? Well, it's cheaper, which is a plus, mm -hmm. but it requires intensive ICU monitoring because you're essentially making the patient intoxicated. Right. And it's actually quite difficult to maintain those stable therapeutic levels. Dosing can be tricky. Okay, so you block the enzyme with fompizol or ethanol, but often that antidote isn't enough, right? Even if it's given early. Why is hemodialysis so frequently required for methanol poisoning? That's a really important point. Because of methanol's chemical properties, it's a small molecule, low molecular weight, it doesn't bind much to proteins in the blood, low volume of distribution. All that means. It means hemodialysis is incredibly efficient at removing it from the blood. Okay. Dialysis simultaneously clears both the unmetabolized methanol and, crucially, the toxic formic acid that has already accumulated. It tackles both problems. So it cleans the blood of both the source and the product. What are the strict indications? When do clinicians say, okay, we absolutely need dialysis now? Generally, any severe clinical signs would trigger it. Severe acidosis that's hard to correct, coma, seizures, the appearance of any new visual deficits. Like that halo vision or blurry vision. Exactly. Or just persistently high anion GAF numbers, despite antidote therapy. Dialysis is often initiated even in patients who get fomepazole early. Why is that? If the enzyme is blocked. To rapidly reduce the methanol's half-life, get it out faster, and therefore mitigate the risk of any delayed toxicity, shorten the length of stay in the ICU, and reduce overall drug exposure. So often a multi-pronged approach. Makes sense. Okay, we've gone through the chemistry, the damage, the treatment. Let's circle back finally to prevention. What are the essential takeaways for the listener? The really critical deterrence strategies. Yeah, this is key. The medical sources are really consistent on this. Mm -hmm. Simple preventative steps save lives. First, always store household chemicals in their original clearly labeled containers. Don't put them in like old water bottles. Right. Bad idea. Terrible idea. Second, products containing methanol wiper fluid, solvents, antifreeze must be stored securely, ideally in locked areas, completely inaccessible to children. Locked up. Locked up. And finally, because of the severity and that really deceptive latent period we talked about, any suspected exposure, even if the person seems fine, requires immediate evaluation in an emergency department. Don't wait. Do not wait. Yep. And prompt consultation with a medical toxicologist or a regional poison center is crucial, even if the diagnosis isn't certain yet. Get expert advice early. That delayed onset of symptoms really is what makes this so incredibly terrifying, isn't it? The prognosis seems to hinge entirely on catching it early, acting fast. It really does. Patients <laughs> who get treatment promptly you know, for significant amounts of formic acid have formed generally recover very well. They can walk away fine. But the alternative. The permanent morbidity, the visual impairment, the potential blindness, the neurological damage that looks like Parkinson's that's largely reserved for those patients who present late or whose diagnosis is unfortunately missed during that critical window when they might have seemed okay. So we've tracked how methanol, the simple chemical found in so many household items, gets metabolized by our own bodies into essentially a powerful corrosive acid, formic acid. Mm -hmm. And that creates this desperate race against time to prevent permanent damage, especially to the eyes and the brain. Understanding that shift you described from the osmolar gap early on to the widening anion gap acidosis later, that really gives you a clear picture of why immediate intervention is the difference between full recovery and permanent loss.